quality of the video is not up to my standards. I did the best I could with the equipment that I have to improve the quality. Please focus on the content rather than the quality. About what I see happening right now and what we need to do about it. So the book, this is why I wrote the book. I wrote the book for an older person and for a younger person in my life. Um, the older person is a mentor of mine who is the daughter of Holocaust survivors. And we would sit around chatting about news events. And she kept saying, they did this in Germany. They did this in Germany. And at, you know, at that time, I thought that this was a nutty thing to say, really extreme, really rhetorical. And I just disregarded it. But she kept saying, they did this in Germany. They did it in Germany. And she wasn't talking about the later years. Uh, National Socialist outcomes. She was talking about the early years, 1930, 1931, 1932, when Germany was a modern parliamentary democracy, a fragile one, but it would have been very recognizable to us. It was a democracy. And so she was talking about the very early pressures on a democracy, legal pressures on a democracy, by people who were intent on closing down that democracy. And you know, I, I kept sort of brushing this off, but finally she sat me down and she gave me a stack of books and she almost physically said, you know, read. And I started reading. And honestly, my hair stood on end because I saw that she was right. She wasn't being rhetorical at all. That in fact, not only were there tactical echoes from the past, but that what I was seeing was actual scenes recurring, imagery recurring, language, sound bites recurring in modern events in America. So then I began reading even more about uh, how societies, how democracies closed down or how would-be despots crack down on a democracy movement. So I read about Italy in the 20s and all, as always Mussolini was the great innovator. He sort of pioneered this technology of closing down a modern democracy. Um, I read about Germany in the 30s, as I mentioned, about Russia in the 30s, about East Germany in the 50s, Czechoslovakia in the 60s, Pinochet's coup in Chile, and I read about the Chinese crackdown on the democracy movement at the end of the 80s. And what became completely clear to me is that every would-be despot, every would-be dictator, whether they're on the left or the right, does the same 10 things. There's a blueprint to closing down an open society or crushing a democracy movement. And that, you know, Mussolini kind of drafted this blueprint and then Hitler studied Mussolini, Stalin studied Hitler. The great dictators all kind of perfected it from one another. But then the petty dictators all over the world in the latter part of the 20th century, beginning of this century, reproduce the blueprint. We teach the blueprint at the School for the Americas. We teach the blueprint. So that, if you remember Thailand last spring, in, you know, in one week it was a democracy, a week later it was a military dictatorship. And it was like they were going through a, checking, a, a shopping list in the way they were. That was the blueprint. You see Burma, Myanmar, you know, two weeks ago, because I know the blueprint, I was looking at my watch. Today they're marching the street. In 48 hours they're going to be shooting on the monks protesting. In a week they're going to be uh, suspending communications. The blueprint is predictive. And what was even more chilling to me, and this is where I really have to applaud you for coming here on a Thursday night when you could be watching America's Next Top Model and, and listening to this. Um, it's very brave of you. Uh, what became clear to me is that each of these 10 steps, these 10 classic steps that every would-be dictator puts in place are underway right now in the United States. I also had to write this book when I realized that because of a younger person in my life, two people actually, Jennifer Gandon and Chris Lee. She's a wonderful 28-year-old uh, student that I mentored, a writer, and she was marrying Chris, who's a wonderful 28-year-old activist. And knowing the storm clouds that were gathering around this young couple, I realized that, you know, I had to do more than just get them something from Crate and Barrel. You know, um, that I had to give them 
something that would help them in a time like this. And so I, I wrote the book really for them as well as for my, my older friend because what it is is a kind of refresher, a reminder to Americans, we don't tend to think about history a lot, I don't either, you know, about how societies closed down in the past, a blueprint, and also a refresher uh, about what democracy is and how to sustain it at a time when it's under assault. Um, so that's why I wrote this book. And actually, Chris's own story is kind of very moving to me because his mom was 28 herself when she took the four-month-old Chris in her arms and fled Vietnam to get into a boat and sail across the ocean as a refugee, as a boat person, to arrive in this country because she understood liberty the way the founders understood liberty. You know, it's, it's an understanding we've kind of forgotten, we've gotten lazy about. She understood that it was worth risking her life and her child's life to raise her baby in liberty, in freedom. So that's the kind of consciousness we have to remember now in order to fight back against the kind of pressures that I'll be describing. So what are these 10 steps? You know, countries where Quakers were tortured by the state for their beliefs, that's why they came to Philadelphia. And so the founders, you know, in their hearts and their lived experiences knew what tyranny was. And so they wanted to create a place where you were safe from that kind of oppression. And that's why they set their, our system of checks and balances as they did. Checks and balances, what a boring term, right? I mean, we are not taught that this system is this sexy, passionate, amazing, inspiring concept, this radical vision of human self-determination. Um, but they knew without a doubt that it was human nature to abuse power if power was unchecked and that that was why these checks and balances were so important. So what are these 10 steps that so profoundly assault the founder's vision and put us at risk? The first thing every would-be dictator does is to invoke a terrifying internal and external threat. The second thing a would-be despot always does is to create a secret prison system where torture takes place that is outside the rule of law. And very often, they will also establish military tribunals that strip prisoners of due process. Again, Lenin was the innovator this time, but Mussolini studied Lenin and developed his system called Confino. Hitler studied Stalin and developed the people's court system I beg your pardon, Hitler studied Mussolini with the people's court system and Stalin studied Hitler. And so what happens when you have a military tribunal system and a secret prison system outside the rule of law where torture takes place is that it starts to put pressure on the rest of civil society. I invite you to name a society that created a secret prison system outside the rule of law where torture takes place that didn't sooner or later turn the abuse against its own citizens. So why should we worry about the fact that brown people with Muslim names on this far off island are being tortured? The White House says we don't torture, it's a lie, they're being tortured systemically. People in U.S. held prisons in Iraq are being tortured. People at black sites are being tortured. Why should it bother us? I mean, apart, I mean, my brother's a really decent guy, but he said, you know, that's not my issue before he read my argument. And so apart from the moral issue, why should we worry that the state has legalized torture? The Indian reason we should worry is that in what I call a fascist shift, and I use that term very conservatively, I use it technically, not rhetorically. I, there are many definitions of fascism. My dictionary definition is when the state starts to use terror against the individual in an effort to push back democracy. So we should worry about the fact that the state has essentially legalized torture of these marginal people, people who are marginal to us, because what always happens in a fascist shift is that the state will start by abusing people that no one 
in the mainstream really identifies with much. You know, in, in Germany, it was anarchists, communists, homosexuals, Jews, gypsies, thank you. And then what always happens is there's a blurring of the line and the, the, the news starts to catch up more and more members of civil society, mainstream society, and it's always the same cast of characters. It's us, basically. Um, journalists, editors, opposition leaders, labor leaders, and outspoken clergy. So, we sh you know, and, and Germany is so instructive in this regard because, you know, people don't realize that it didn't start with crematoria. You know, that what happens when you create a secret prison system where torture takes place is it always metastasizes, starts out little and informal and gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And like in, in Berlin in 1931, 1932, torture was still illegal. The Nazis weren't even in power. They were a minority uh, party. It was still a democracy. There were opposition, there were marches, there was, you know, everything was, was as it, it should have been. But the SA, a paramilitary force, we'll get to that, started to create these makeshift torture cellars where they would torment these marginal people. And everyone knew about it. They thought it was funny. There were cartoons about it in the German press. It's like, you know, that show 24. It's like, that's funny. Everyone accepted it. But then it doesn't take too long before the line starts to be blurred. So why is this so urgently relevant to us? Most Americans don't realize that the president now claims the power to say to any one of us, Raul, you're an enemy combatant. Anne, enemy combatant. Now, it doesn't matter. You can be innocent. You can be Republican. You can be a devoted, you know, evangelical. It doesn't matter. Enemy combatant is a status offense. Your innocence does not protect you. Your party affiliation does not protect you. And if he says, and Naomi, enemy combatant, it's like Mother May I. If he, on, on his say so alone, he can name you or me an enemy combatant, and they can't torture us yet, but they can take us to a Navy brig to a 10 by 12 foot cell and keep us in solid, American citizens, innocent American citizens, in solitary confinement. <laughs> 